for sharing our excitement uh, for this evening. Uh, in which we are very pleased uh, for the company of our guests, Mr. Mustafa Akhil and uh, Mr. Yos Lachendijk. Uh, thank you both of them for being here. Uh, today I will talk about Purchase Network uh, and the Purchase Network Church readings in specific, basically what we are doing and uh, what we are planning to do. Uh, Purchase Network, as named expert, cares about its members' improvement. It's innovative, follows recent issues and updates its members. And uh, in order to talk about how Turkey readings has emerged, as all of you have recognized so far, Turkey is in the process of uh, change and transformation in several different areas. And uh, this can easily be seen in the economy and in politics, especially in the uh, international arena. But uh, strikingly enough, uh, there is something in the society. People are more involved in the events around them, or they are more open to question what's going on. Uh, in a way, they are kind of more conscious uh, on the, uh, you know, to question back and to criticize today. So, uh, so uh, this year, as we are celebrating almost the 15th uh, of the presence uh, of people from Turkey uh, in Europe, uh, we as Turkish Dutch citizens, we are also aware of this process and we want to evaluate the process with the help of uh, valuable experts as we have today. So uh, actually this is basically what Perkins Network Turk Readings is for. And uh, as you know, 2012 is the 400th year of uh, relations between Turkey and Netherlands. And it has become a kind of nice coincidence that we have started our program this year. And uh, with our program, uh, we aim to contribute both to society and to our members. We want to understand the recent socio-political issues under the effect of this ongoing transformation process in Turkey. And we want to evaluate the contemporary movements in the values and the way things are done. And uh, we want to analyze the historical backgrounds of the socio-economical issues Turkey is facing so far. In this context, we are organizing speeches, speech, speeches on the topics that are important, that we think they are important from our perspective. So uh, our first speech was held on the 25th of January uh, by Mr. Osman Can, and we have analyzed the uh, new constitutional process of Turkey. And today we will look at the process of democratization of Turkey, which will be analyzed by Mr. Mustafa Akil and Mr. Yoz Lahtanday. And our next topics are the process of change in Turkish economy, politics and intellectuality, the freedom of expression, thought and belief in Turkey, and the dynamics of unsolved terror problem of Turkey. These are the topics we have come up with so far. Uh, and we hope to continue to dig into different areas uh, with your attendance, assistance and suggestions. So uh, for the upcoming uh, speeches, conferences, please uh, do follow our website. It's www.spiritusnetwork.nl And please do not hesitate to send your um, suggestions and also critics. And uh, we also thank for the partnership of, partnership of Compass Student Foundation and the sponsorship of Census.org. Uh, thank you and enjoy the evening. Then is it the time for my first guest speaker for today to introduce him. Uiteraard uh, kennen we hem van zijn columns, maar ik heb natuurlijk ook uh, de wat edele Google geraadpleegd. En wat hebben we daarover meneer Akko gevonden? Het meest recente, hij is auteur van uh, het boek Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. Uh, ik heb begrepen dat het recent is verschenen, maar wellicht dat hij daar straks ook nog uh, iets over kan vertellen. Uh, hij is afgestudeerd uh, in Boaz aan de Boazic Universiteit, uh, internationale betrekking en politiek. Politieke wetenschappen, uh, maar, maar deels ook een, een, vanuit een geschiedkundig perspectief. Dus beide heren vandaag hebben ook een geschiedenisachtergrond. Wellicht dat ze ook het democratiseringsproces ook vanuit uh, dat opzicht kunnen benaderen. 
Verder, uh, je hebt Turkish er een spreekwoord dat iemand uh, tien talenten in al zijn vingers heeft. En dat is hij wel een beetje. Hij is columnist voor uh, de, het dagblad Star, Juliet Daily News. Uh, daarnaast uh, verzorgt hij programma's op tv's, uh, op, op uh, diverse kanalen. Uh, zijn artikelen zijn onder andere verschenen in Newsweek, Foreign Affairs, Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, etc. Et Om u niet al te lang uh, uh, van hem ook uh, uh, te weerhouden, zal ik het woord ook aan hem geven. Advantages of uh, having lived in Turkey now for two years. The language is simply uh, quite complicated to learn. Um, so I will speak in English and I will more or less continue where Mustafa uh, left off. Um, I'm happy he covered uh, the history uh, of, uh, of, of Turkey as a secular republic, uh, the changes that came with, uh, with the AK Party in 2002. Uh, what I will do, I'll focus on the AK Party period, so starting in 2002. November 2002 elections uh, up until uh, today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't, he didn't use it, but uh, um, what I'll do is uh, because the, the theme of tonight is uh, democratization, I'll uh, pick three issues that, according to many, uh, are, are at the heart of, uh, of democratization or the lack of that uh, in Turkey. Uh, one is the position of the military. Politics. The second is the uh, Kurdish issue, uh, and thirdly, and I'll probably spend most of my time on that, is the uh, quite hot issue of today is uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the media, uh, because there's a lot of um, talk about that, uh, a lot of discussion about that, both uh, in uh, Turkey, uh, but also in the Netherlands and in other uh, European countries. Um, let me start by saying that if it's about democratization um, in Turkey, don't believe the two extremes. Uh, don't believe the ones who say that uh, there are no problems uh, anymore. Uh, AK Party was very successful and they managed to get rid of all the problems that were created by the uh, previous Kemalist system. It's simply not true. As Mustafa said, there are quite a lot of ongoing problems, not so much created by AK Party, but they are still there and they still have to be uh, solved. Um, also don't believe those people who say that all the existing problems have been created by, uh, by the AK Party and that it was perfect uh, before 2002, which is, as I think we've <laughs> demonstrated very clearly, uh, not true either. Uh, the reality is, is much more mixed, uh, it's much more of a mixed picture. Uh, and I'll try to um, uh, make that point um, on, on those three issues that I mentioned. First, uh, the military. Uh, I mean, from a, Dutch, from a, from a European point of view, it was hardly imaginable if one came to Turkey uh, at the end of the 90s to see how immense the influence of the army was, not only on security, but I remember, for instance, creating uh, the content of a film festival uh, in Istanbul where there were two Kurdish movies on, on the program and where the representative of the army in the committee dealing with film festivals said, no, no, uh, we're not going to have that festival unless you delete those two films because uh, as the military we don't like these and uh, so uh, get rid of them, which happened. <coughs> the festival was there, the movies that the military didn't like were deleted. It's only a small example of where the military had a huge influence on issues that go far beyond, I think, their competences and what they should be dealing about, which is national security. So this was a situation that from a European perspective, from a European point of view, uh, was not acceptable, was strange, it was hard to explain um, for a country that was running for membership of the EU since 1999. So if you go back, you look at all the reports of the European Commission, the European Parliament, over the last 10 years, you will see that the top priority, number one, diminish the role of the military in politics. Uh, let the military do what they're good at, or supposed to be good at, that is national security, and get them out of all, these other, all the other issues. And that happened. Uh, I think hand in hand with the EU, 
one can see that I think this is the, the only, one and only issue that the agenda, the political agenda of the AK party was run totally parallel with the political agenda of the EU. What the EU demanded was exactly what the AK party wanted. So you could see a strong cooperation there on all kinds of issues, um, starting with the role of the National Security Council, which was sort of a shadow government that before 2002 more or less dictated to the civilian politicians what should happen. That role, it was reorganized and its role was diminished, which I think is a very, very important thing uh, to happen. And uh, these days, I mean, who, who cares, who listens to the National Security Council? Its influence has gone down and I think that's a good, uh, good thing. Um, on many other issues, there was a strong cooperation there between, as I said, the EU agenda and what the AK party wanted. That was helped by, of course, the exposure uh, of the army in uh, several coup plots. Uh, in, in newspapers like Taraf, uh, it was known, it became known, that also after AK party came to power, or maybe especially after AK party came to power, uh, there were plans within the military either to get rid of AK party or to make life very difficult on AK party. Um, and these were exposed. These, these were in the newspapers, these were, this, these were being discussed. And you could see from that moment onward that, for instance, the opinion polls, uh, the, the standing of the army went down because people didn't, they trusted the army and they didn't want to, the army to go into that kind of coup <coughs> against the government that was democratically elected in 2002, 2007 and 2011. It undermined the legitimacy of the army. People saw that uh, all these well-paid uh, generals were to a certain extent planning coups against the democratically elected government, which is not what they're supposed uh, to do. Uh, what I think was very good um, for a democratic, a democratizing uh, uh, society is that mistakes made by the army were being discussed uh, in the newspaper. Uh, there was criticism about uh, operational mistakes being made uh, in the southeast of certain operations that nobody understood why this famous and big uh, army lost out to a bunch of uh, terrorists uh, in, in certain places. These were good things for a country like Turkey to happen because it made the army a regular thing to discuss. Not a thing that could not be touched, not a thing that was uh, outside of the, uh, the rules and the laws of society, but an institution, a very important one, still could be discussed. I think there, to be honest, I think it's, it's up to this major achievement that they managed in those 10 years, almost 10 years that they're in power now, to bring the role of the army back to what it should be in a democratic society. Last example, for instance, is that the uh, obligatory courses on national security given by military at school uh, were, were abolished. Um, does it mean that, that we're there yet? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, there's still an ongoing debate in the parliament control over the budget. Uh, the budget of the army is without, is beyond scrutiny. Uh, the parliamentarians have the power, uh, but they use their power for five minutes and, and then the budget is passed. Uh, this is not a serious democratic scrutiny of a, of a, of an, uh, of a defense budget. Uh, that should improve. Uh, the, the old curricula uh, at, at military academies are still the same. Um, Chief of Staff still reports to the Prime Minister instead of the Minister of Defence. So there's a lot, quite a long list of things to do, but looking back uh, over those last 10 years, uh, as I said, I think it's one of the major achievements of this, of, of this government, of this party, that on this particular issue of democratization, um, they achieved uh, what I think uh, was a good goal, as I said, supported by the EU, that is to bring the role of the army back to what it should be. Second issue, the, the Kurdish issue. Um, there already we're getting into the mixed zone. Um, Mustafa mentioned uh, some important steps uh, ahead. So again, there don't believe those people who say that nothing has been achieved, and also don't believe the guys who say that all the problems are solved. It's not true, it's both true. Some problems have been solved. It is possible to speak in public in Kurdish, or to play music in Kurdish. Yeah unimaginable for many, many of you, but that was not possible uh, before 2000. And it could get you into, into jail. Uh, there is TRT6, 24 hours, 24-7 uh, television, public uh, <coughs> television stations uh, in Kurdish. Uh, Kurdish politicians make their campaigns in Kurdish, uh, and they have been elected since 2007. There is a Kurdish political party in the parliament, which is good. It's a major